The new Outlander plug-in hybrid is arguably the second most exciting car the brand has made this century. It combines the previous strengths of Mitsubishi with the best parts of their new alliance. Plus, you don't need mafia connections to buy one. The new Outlander and plug-in hybrid version are based on the same platform as the Nissan Rogue. No, wait, wait, listen. The plug-in hybrid Mitsu uses the trusty MyVec 2.4 liter that's older than most high school students. It also does not use a Nissan CVT. In fact, it employs a trick direct drive one-speed automatic. The battery is also liquid-cooled, which should further assist longevity. But I'll talk about that more later. This all comes in a versatile style, upscale, and technically three-row SUV form factor, though that doesn't mean much if you can't buy one. Thankfully, the Outlander is easily accessible. There are 1,300 plug-in models currently listed on cars.com in the US. All of the dealers I called in my region are also selling them at sticker. There are just 300 RAV4 primes listed right now, most of which are isolated to specific regions, and it has a higher demand with far less supply. That's the perfect recipe for dealers to market adjust you into your retirement fund. Starting at 41,000, the plug-in hybrid is about 10 grand more than a standard all-wheel drive Outlander. Unfortunately, my tester is 50,000. However, it feels appropriately upscale. On the road, it is primarily driven by two electric motors. This is rear biased, unlike most of its competition. Another unique trait is that the front wheels are only directly powered by the gas engine when cruising above 4 Putting around town or even under full throttle acceleration, the gas engine only acts as a generator, helping boost the electric motor's output to achieve a peak of 248 ponies. The power delivery feels like an EV. Motor Trend got 1 to 60 in 6.5 seconds, and that sounds right when you're in power mode. Even when in its EV configuration, the Outlander accelerates like a torquey four cylinder SUV. The engine can actually stay off. Plus, if you drive like a Prius owner, after two melatonin chewies, this can go 38 miles on electric only or a blazing 420 as a hybrid. When you deplete the battery, the 2.4 MyVec will continuously provide electricity to the motors. However, gas mileage is disappointing then, as it is a four banger from the mid 2000s motivating a 4,700 pound SUV. Yes, this thing weighs a couple hundred pounds more than the outgoing Tacoma TRD Pro. With help from a liquid cooled battery, it does offer DC fast charging which can juice up the 20 kilowatt hour capacity with haste compared to the slower competition. The fine print is that you have to spend 47 grand on an SEL to get that and it only works at certain stations. Due to over 300 pound feet of torque, passing power is great, but I didn't get to test it at higher speeds as I only had 15 minutes to drive it on the road so my impressions are limited. The brakes are just strong enough but natural and easy to modulate. There's also also an innovative pedal mode, which combines its somewhat mild regenerative braking and the real brakes to bring you to a crawl without touching the stop pedal, unlike a true one pedal mode that will not bring you to a complete halt. Wind and tire noise are present, but not disturbing. The motor's whirring makes for a futuristic vibe, and the grumbly four-cylinder rarely speaks up. When you demand more, it sounds like this as it spins the generator. The suspension isolates small to medium imperfections well. Even over railroad tracks, the ride was smooth. On relatively tame roads, it seems to find a nice middle ground between soft and firm. It's let down by the weight, but it doesn't feel as hefty as the number would suggest. The steering is direct, it's fairly tight on center, the feel is numb, but it has just enough weight to feel substantial. I need to drive it over my twisty, unforgiving Indiana roads for more thoughts. Thanks to the Midwestern Automotive Media Association, I drove this off-road too. The Outlander FEV has 7.8 inches of ground clearance, and the angles aren't friendly for actual off-roading, though traction shouldn't be an issue as this has super all-wheel control, but what does that actually mean? 
so there's no drive line connecting the front and rear, and there are no limited slip differentials. Both of them are open. Instead, this uses brake vectoring like many others in the class to transfer power side to side in low traction, low speed scenarios. But on top of that, it uses the brakes on all four corners for yaw control. Outside of sounding like an off-putting imitation of a southern accent, yaw control will break the inside wheels to rotate the car for better control at higher speeds too. From what I've seen, it seems to work well, but outside of the rear bias, it's not as special as the old school Mitsubishi yaw control that could split power through the rear diff. The most important part of this to me is that it should be reliable. This is a low output version of the 4B12 four cylinder. The engine has been very dependable for Mitsubishi in the past. And while they have had better luck with Jatco CVTs than Nissan, you won't have to worry about that as trusted supplier GKN makes the unique transaction axle here. Hybrid batteries tend to last around 12 to 15 years, but with improved cooling and new tech, that could be extended, so I don't know what to expect. Time will have to tell. This model is too new for me to add anything else, but I am highly optimistic. Additionally, this has a 5-year, 60,000-mile bumper-to-bumper warranty with 10 years and 100,000 miles of coverage on the powertrain and hybrid components. The long-term downside is that this is not a cheap car, and Mitsubishi's resale value is historically low. The new plug-in Outlander is a huge step forward, so I think it should improve, but really anything I have to say here is purely speculation. What I can firmly vouch for is the wow factor. I used to own a 2011 Outlander, and while it was reliable, practical, and quirky, the interior felt like a McDonald's play place with its cheap plastics and mysterious rattles. This new model equips materials every bit as good as a new Mazda. The build quality is strong at first glance, and panel fitment is sufficient for a 40 to 50 grand SUV. Higher trim models go a touch heavy on glossy black plastics, but the physical buttons and dials make this satisfying and easy to live with. The seats are comfortable and supportive, even for me at 6 foot 3, and the lumbar adjustment appears to be standard, as is dual zone automatic climate control and proximity unlock and lock. A power rear gate, wireless charger, heated front seats, and leatherette upholstery come on just the SE, and the list of amenities continues as you work your way up. If you want to cause migraines for disgruntled Mitsu fans, buy the appearance-focused rally art trim. The Outlander is techie too. The 9-inch infotainment screen on the SE and above grants wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The UI is basic and does feel outclassed by some competitors, but the response time is acceptable and the screen gets bright with deep blacks. The standard digital gauge cluster is more exuberant, with funny gauges, but it's full of info and cool animations. Hopping into the back, you will find available tri-zone climate control and enough space for people over six foot to fit comfortably in both rows. There's also a third row that is strictly for children. While the seats are surprisingly plush, if your third row occupants have legs or self-respect, the second row needs to be adjusted so far forward that nobody's going to be pleased. Its purpose is centered around the sudden need to take an extra kid or two home legally. So the third row earns brownie points just for existing. They're also clever. They store extremely flat and make for an expansive cargo area. I'm impressed with this practicality given this also has a rear motor and battery pack underneath. And the ski pass-through was a nice addition. Safety-wise, the standard Outlander performed exceptionally well in crash tests and all come with autonomous braking, blind spot monitoring, and lane departure prevention standard. But for lane centering and adaptive cruise, you need the SE. Overall, the Outlander plug-in hybrid is practical enough for family work, luxurious enough to impress your passengers, electric enough to make your commute cheap, while also providing a powertrain that is relaxed and proven. Factor in that it is one of the only PHEVs that you can purchase without torment from a dealer or waitlist, and we have a hidden gem. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then be sure to leave a like and help me embarrass the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the bell for more. Follow me on Patreon for an additional podcast, and I'll catch you in the next one.